uh, Smart Contracts as a Service. Uh, probably a better title would be uh, Smart Contract Microservices. Um, so my name is Brooklyn Zalika. I'm XP basically everywhere on the internet. Uh, I am the co-founder and CTO at Fission, uh, where we're building a, essentially a decentralized Firebase with user-controlled data uh, for non-Web3 devs. Of course, you can use it in Web3. It's all Web3 tech underneath, but so that people don't have to worry about uh, learning all of this stuff in the secret system, they can just use it. Um, I used to live in Osaka. I love it here. It's so good to be back. I was so happy when I saw that was going to be here and have a chance to uh, visit again. Uh, I'm a uh, programming language theory and virtual machine enthusiast, um, and I used to do Ethereum R&D full-time uh, on a grant basis, um, but these days we're doing primarily uh, IPFS stuff, so I'm visiting from uh, IPFS and distributed systems land. Uh, I'm the co-author of a number of EIPs, including the EVM Summer Team Static Jumps, which uh, we had hoped to get into this hard fork. Um, that didn't happen, but there's a, a researchers of interest, so maybe that will happen soon. Uh, and uh, also, the other one to really note here is 1066, which is what most of this talk will be on, um, the uh, sta standardized status quo for uh, intercontract communication. Uh, in uh, Ethereum Classic land, where this is being ported over as well, uh, this is uh, ESET 1050. Um, the other uh, thing to note here as well is this is ending up in a lot of other standards, so uh, a few of the security token standards, notably the Family 1400 um, security tokens, uh, use this as a dependency as well. So this is already finding its way out into industry, uh, things that deal with regulation, uh, etc. Uh, last night I opened Twitter and saw this uh, tweet, uh, so it sounds like uh, there's interest in getting this uh, embedded directly in Viper and Solidity and doing uh, on-chain translation of these as well, which we have um, uh, proof of concept code for on GitHub. So let's talk about uh, web of contracts. So uh, the goal uh, of this project broadly is in three parts. Uh, first, write fewer lines of code. The more code you write, the more likely you are to introduce a bug. Um, it's also, you know, development time, uh, testing, uh, expensive to do verification on, etc. Um, so you can have higher confidence in code that lives on chain that you call into that has been uh, audited by, say, Quantstamp or uh, Consensus Diligence and has been signed off, and the community understands how it works. Okay? And last goal is to make uh, Ethereum more accessible. Uh, we have uh, more semantic codes now that can uh, be understood. You can both look at the, the flow of these codes through the contract, uh, through a, a web of contracts, uh, or propagate them back out to the user and then translate them into uh, human readable language, which, time permitting, uh, we may take a look, a look at at the very end. High level idea. Um, just kind of like how on the web we have status codes that come along with every request, so like a 404, uh, we should have these as well for smart contracts, right? This lets you do automated behavior or react to things in a, uh, in a smarter, more contextual way than just true or false, or having some custom uh, response type for every request, right? The other nice thing, because this is, it all fits into a single byte, which makes it very, very portable, means that we can do things uh, across different chains if we have interchain communication, like the ETC, ETH, Peace Bridge, um, and uh, cross shard communication uh, with ETH2. So obviously this draws a lot of inspiration from Unix and HTTP and the actor model. Um, what do all these things have in common? Composition. We want to have contract composition rather than taking an uh, existing contract, editing it a bunch, and hoping that it still works the way that we had assumed before, right? Even if you have a fully audited library and then you go audit that and deploy it, you've broken a lot of the core assumptions. You have to get it re-audited. Ethereum is a shared system. Why aren't we leveraging each other's code? Why do we have 50 million ERC-20 tokens instead of most of that logic encapsulated in a single contract? And uh, if we can build these high-value, high-reuse contracts, is there a way to make money doing that? So, uh, on-chain microservices, 
something you know a little bit like this, where you can have contracts common to other contracts that are all fairly lightweight and thin and do a single thing. Um, yeah, and that's basically what I just said. Uh, sort of add a, a core technical idea. So today you deploy some sort of contracts, there's a bunch of these living on chain, but they're pretty much siloed, right? We're on this big shared system. You deploy one, maybe two or three contracts, and they talk to each other in some special way, and they don't really talk to each other, right? So we're on the shared system, but we really have a bunch of small mini blockchains inside of our blockchain. And, you know, sometimes, sure, they, they do talk to another, like maybe that's CryptoKitties, and, you know, you're calling into it. Uh, but for the most part, they're just kind of there's a lot of uh, duplication and a lot of things being redeployed onto the chain all the time. So what if we can uh, break those barriers and uh, call between them? So in this case, the two uh, multicolored ones here are uh, you know, secure, verified on-chain services. They can maybe talk to each other and other contracts can talk to them as well, um, use them as a proxy, call into them for authentication, um, or to do some, uh, do some, you know, uh, computation, do elliptic curves, etc. So, what do these codes actually look like? As I said before, they are a single byte, and if you break a byte in half, you get a nibble. Uh, so, the just like how in HTTP you'll have say a 400 range or a 200 range. Um, we have the same, that they are flipped around, and that's uh, mainly to make it easy to decompose them programmatically. So here is 0x41. The first four bits are the category. The last four bits are the reason. Uh, and if you have something where the category is 0, uh, this is the same case as having you know, 400 in HTTP, where it just tells you that this is a you know, user-generated or you know, user-side error, client error, um, with no additional context. So this one just says that you know, so, uh, the generic case for the B reason. Uh, this breaks things into a table, like so. Uh, it's actually even more structured than this. It's uh, all odd numbers are um, success and all even numbers are failure. Uh, so the uh, columns are categories, so things like time logic or uh, authentication or negotiation governance. Uh, even off-chain flows are captured on here. Uh, and the rows are reasons, so you can say, for example, uh, we have the two row, which is uh, searching and matching and awaiting, and together we get that you're awaiting a match. So both, we can do this, you know, reading them out, um, decompose them, you only have to memorize uh, 16 by 16, so 32, as opposed to have to memorize the whole 256 uh, code space. There's a helper library uh, as well uh, on NPM. Uh, it lets you write these in a more human-readable way and process them uh, more programmatically and get a little bit more information out of them. Uh, so here are some enums for category and reason that you can then uh, stick together, pull apart, and you know, just do analysis, say, like, you know, this needs to be uh, category four and one of the following reasons, for example. Uh, and you can also automate um, uh, reverting as well. So reverts are uh, built right in, full supports. Uh, in this case, this require OK says it needs to be a odd number, otherwise it will revert uh, when it gets the response back. With a hard-coded message, we can also automate the messages uh, as well uh, with uh, localized on-chain translation, which again, hopefully we'll have time for uh, at the end. So uh, toy flow for contract messaging. So we have three, um, uh, three players in this scenario. We have a, a user, this, the robot may be a proxy contract or the user themselves, uh, some intermediary, and then a uh, token. We ask for send it a buy request. Um, that gets propagated across and it stashes that. Or some, you know, this, uh, uh, this proxy is asked for a buy of this amount, but it responds with, you know, we're not ready yet, but we will ping you back when we're ready. So this is all on-chain, we're not waiting for um, 
uh, events or anything like that, and you know, pinging it, pulling it with the server. Um, we're just saying, I'll call you back when, when I'm ready. Uh, proxy holds on to that and then propagates that back out to the user. Some time goes by, a uh, user gets, uh, uh, gets anxious, you know, is this done yet? So they say, you know, it's done yet, and says, no, I don't even have to go and check. Let's just revert, pretend this, this transaction never happened, and that's a no. Uh, sometimes later, uh, we come open for business, maybe uh, you know, a lockup period's done, or uh, you know, we've actually launched the thing, and it says, ready, you know, are you still interested? And yeah, in the meantime, I've had a bunch of orders come in. Uh, great, let's uh, pay for that, that's a great and completed, and probably case that out to the user. There's been some discussion recently about adding uh, messaging, like you know, an inbox or while you were away from the chain to the, uh, to the blockchain, um, or in, into wallets rather, uh, and then we can then propagate that out uh, into that system as well. Uh, for stateless service contracts, uh, again, this is audited efficient library code. Um, as I mentioned before, if you override functions on a, uh, a library, you just get a solidity the library, they say, you know, it's been all, uh, all checked and all good, and then you start overriding methods. That audit no longer holds. You may have broken something, right? If you made a small change like changing the name of a token, that's probably fine, but as soon as you start changing behavior, uh, who knows? Right? If we deploy these on chain, especially for high value components, we're doing things with finance and you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, um, then we can get these, as a community, verified and checked. Um, and then they live on chain and don't get changed. So we know that this is the exact code that we expect. Um, why not, actually, I should say, why not redeploy safe math? Uh, safe math is used so much, um, it's impractical because jump is so cheap and a call out is more expensive. But for anything more um, uh, involved in that, uh, it starts to make sense uh, quite quickly. So here's, a, again, a simple toy example. So we have a, a token, which is just the things that you would normally override, uh, calls out into a stateless ERC-20, uh, makes a request and says, yep, yeah, cool, you have, um, you know, you're, you're in the range to do that, uh, you, know, you have enough balance, etc." Um, and then uh, you know, we can check with, uh, say, uh, your C902, is the this transfer restricted? And they say, actually, this, uh, the person you're trying to transfer to has been banned, so you're not uh, allowed to do this transaction. So we're breaking things out into reusable components. Um, that 902 could even be, uh, well, which we'll look at in a moment, uh, a, um, uh, you know, a KYC service, let's say, so that you don't have to KYC in each smart contract, you can just uh, send that out to another um, another service provider, uh, which is a stateful service contract. So sometimes it's not the behavior that's the important thing in a smart contract, but the data inside it. And calling into that might be um, uh, valuable, not just so that you don't have to, uh, you know, KYC users on a per um, uh, per token basis, but uh, so that. You don't have to do that at all, you don't have to worry about it, somebody's gonna KYC it once, they're good to go. So, uh, in this example with a token, it checks with one of these validators, we send it a message, uh, and uh, sorry, this is actually a real world scenario um, from security tokens. So we have a cross-border trade between uh, Canada and uh, South Korea, and they both have different regulatory requirements and you need to be able to match both of them. And these requirements sometimes change. So you need to be able to keep, um, uh, uh, just call out to uh, a contract where the independent logic is, is kept separately. <clears throat> so you call out to the Korean one, uh, comes back and says, yes, uh, you know, you're in the, um, uh, in the time, you're about to expire, don't worry about checking with this other service now because we don't need to check for an override, uh, they're actually, you know, they're, they're okay. And then we check with the other regulator, which calls into some uh, some database. You know, we get back yes. You know, they're in the database. Uh, propagate out a more uh, specific error for this use case, so it doesn't have to propagate the exact same message. We can change it as we go, and then come back with yes. 
uh, your transfer seems to be good. Um, some quick thoughts on making money uh, with this. So it's not that you can't, or that people aren't charging for function calls today. You can, and people are, but I'm surprised that it's not happening more often. Uh, especially with sort of, I've heard fairly recently that state rent is now not happening, but it's not entirely um, a terrible idea in collecting things off chain or getting things off chain that aren't used very much or uh, don't have a high value. So an economy like this makes sense to some degree where you collect value to prove that you are valuable. But even without that, we can uh, support the uh, development efforts of high quality, good audited, and pay for the auditing of these shared smart contracts um, so that uh, we, we end up with a better, more secure chain overall, right? It benefits everybody, and we can overcome the tragedy of the commons because we're not anywhere saying altruistically, please get this audited and put it on chain. We're saying, we'll get this audited and put it there, and then we will recuperate that uh, initial investment. Uh, so this can be done in a couple different ways. You have per invocation, sort of, you know, like AWS minus style charge, which is mostly what you see today. Um, or you can buy licenses on chain. So this might be per contract or prefer, per provider. You could buy a say, subscription model, uh, make it permanent, uh, okay for a certain number of calls or uh, a certain number of blocks, let's say. Right, so you're okay for the next month. Uh, and I have uh, three and a half minutes to get through the user uh, localized feedback uh, part. So uh, this is something that we were talking to a few walls about integrating, but now that MetaMask has a plugin system, uh, which we heard about yesterday, uh, this might be something that we can just implement ourselves. So uh, on-chain localization. Uh, actually, I'll go back. One here, so we have a localization preferences um, singleton on chain, uh, which actually already exists, and then a bunch of different localization for these 256 codes. That's a reasonable number to get translated. Uh, we have current translations, again, as proof of concept in English, Spanish, and Pirate, uh, and are hoping to, to get more as time goes on. We have a couple of partial translations from other languages, but not the full uh, code set yet. So let's look at the success flow. Uh, you're a Japanese speaker and you want to interact with this contract uh, through a wallet, so you send a transaction, uh, it does something and returns back the status code. And now you're done, right? This has come back in the response. We don't have to pay for the rest of this because it's purely a read. So we go to the uh, translations contract or the, uh, the router, essentially, look up the TX origin, transaction origin, user, and look up the row for them, which says that they want uh, Japanese. They grab the text for status code 11, return the text back up, and display it in the UI. Uh, similar for revert flow, so I mentioned earlier, uh, instead of hard coding string to revert, we can do a lookup and then revert. Uh, so similar flow, right? We send a transaction. And then this smart contract needs to revert. So we're going to revert with 4.0. We look at the text for that. Again, look at the TX origin. Uh, grab the text and propagate it back up. And it will show like that. So uh, I, as the developer, don't have to write all the translations myself. They exist. People can register their own and then say, uh, you know, I'm going to use this translation for all of my messaging, right? If we want uh, Ethereum to be widely used and accessible to everybody, like my Czech grandmother doesn't speak English, we did a quick analysis of um, uh, you know, what are the reverts written in on chain, and they're predominantly English, like, like overwhelmingly, with a bit of Chinese, right? So that doesn't really help her much. Uh, and with this, we, we could absolutely get that, uh, get that done. Uh, yeah, and then I'll probably get it like that. Um, and that's all for me. Thank you.